one of the things that Jesus did when he brought together his disciples was he challenged them. He said, I'm going to make you more than just fishers of fish. I'm going to make you into fishers of men. Challenge them to not just follow him, but to help others follow him. And one of the things that we're learning more and more is that effective discipleship requires relationship. And so one of the things that I'm very interested in trying to challenge us to do is to become better at mentoring younger Christians, better at mentoring new members. And a few months ago, we had quite a successful future leaders breakfast. A number of persons shared in that experience and were challenged by the sessions. And one of the things that we talked about at that breakfast was, well, there's work for us to do. And one of the things I want to challenge some of those future leaders who came to that breakfast to consider is to making yourselves available to be a mentor. Mentor to our young people, mentor to our new members, mentors to those who make Christian commitment through the life of this church. So, coming up on the 24th of January is an opportunity for some of that mentoring training. So on that morning, it's a Saturday morning. I know a lot of people don't like to do things on a Saturday morning because there's so many other things to do because you're working all day and so on, all week and so on. But I want you to commit a few hours on that morning, 9.30 to midday, as we engage in some mentoring training. One of the other things I want to challenge us to consider particularly for persons who are new and recent members. They've been here for the last five years, maybe. I want to challenge you to, as the, as the scriptures say in, in Acts, devote yourself to the apostles' teaching. I want to challenge you. During the course of this year, we're going to be having a range of different discipleship teaching opportunities. And I want to encourage you to make yourselves available for those teaching opportunities. And one of those opportunities comes up in the not-too-distant future on Tuesday evening, the 27th, 5.30 to 7.30. Tuesday evening, the 27th, let's talk discipleship. Let's look at where on the discipleship road we are. And that's particularly targeting those who are it's home to anybody. Anybody can come. But I'm particularly targeting those who are new and recent members of our congregation with whom we want to really just lay some foundations as you make this discipleship walk. So please do make note of those upcoming activities. I know that some of you have started the Bible Challenge. Not true? Oh, Yes. And this year, the Bible Challenge is so simple. It is so doable that everybody can do it. Five chapters every week. One chapter a day, Monday to Friday. How easy is that? And that will take us through the New Testament in a year. So we're reading through the book of Mark to begin with. Mark, they say, is the first gospel that was written. So we're reading through the gospel of Mark. And of course, if you're on the challenge, you'd have known that we're, we, have, we did chapter 5 on Friday. So, come tomorrow, it's chapter 6. And it's not too late to join. As, as I, and there are brochures at each of the entrances. Take one of those brochures. It gives you what the reading is for each day, right through the rest of the year. Or if you watch, just follow on the back of your bulletin, you'll see the, what the readings are. For this coming week. But I want to challenge you to take the Bible challenge. As I always say, even if you don't get to reading through everything, you probably will end up reading more than you would normally read if you don't take the challenge. So let me encourage you to take the Bible challenge as we read through the New Testament in a year. 
And this morning, I'm continuing a sermon series we started last week entitled People of the Book. You know which book I'm talking about? People of the Book. And this week, as we continue in that series, I want to ask the question and seek to answer it. How did we get the book? How did we get the Bible? Where did it come from? For if we're going to be people of the book, we have to understand the book, we have to trust the book, and we have to spend time with the book. So may we look this morning, and as we do so, may we ask God's blessing on his word to us. Let's pray. Lord, I ask you now to look into each life here this morning. You know where we are, oh God. You know all the challenges we face on a day-to-day -day basis. You know where we are in our faith journey and in our faith walk. You know what we need even before we ask it. You know, oh God, that we all need to know more about you. So we pray, Lord, that as we learn more about your word, we may commit ourselves to spend time with that word. And so may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts together, be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. How did we get the book? I want to try to answer three questions as we lay some foundations on the, this basic question of how we got the book. I want, to ask, I want to try to answer the question, so what is the book? What is the Bible? And what process got it here? How did it get here? And then I want to look at a ticklish subject and a word that I will explain in a little while. Canonization. Who chose what went into the book? Why are some things left out and why are some things in? We want to talk a little bit about that this morning. So what is the Bible? What is the Bible? You know, there are two very common misconceptions that we sometimes have about the Bible. One of them is the misconception that the Bible was all written down at about the same time. Sometimes we probably even have the view that maybe just one person just sat down and just kind of wrote it down. Or maybe just one group of persons at one, you know, over one sort of season of writing just compile it all together. Not so, as we will see in a little while. One of the other misconceptions we have is that it was really created by a few who wanted to consolidate, to gain, and to maintain power and prestige. That it is really a kind of power thing. And that the Bible is sort of um, designed to just kind of just keep power in the hands of some. It's really a control book. Not so, as we will see in a little while. The word Bible comes from the Greek word Biblia, which means books. And in a real sense, the Bible is really not just one book, it would be accurate to describe it as a library of books. It is a collection of many books. So I want to consider the Bible as a, as a collection of sacred writings inspired by God, but written by at least 40 different human writers. Certainly not one person. 
But these writings were done over a period of 1500 or 1600 years. So certainly not, not just one group of persons in one sitting, in one season, or in one time. Over a long period of time. And the complexity that leads to how these different materials are written and how they come together is a fascinating story of how God has intervened, if you will, to make it possible that a revelation of God's self might be made known to all humanity. Each biblical book has a very unique history and took a distinct route on its way to inclusion in the Bible. It is a library of different books that are arranged into two main sections. We talk about the Old Testament, and we talk about the New Testament. And of course, there is much controversy over how many books are included in each of those sections. For there are some who would hold that there are some other books that ought to be included. So, most Protestant churches would hold that 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, total of 66 books, constitute the Scriptures, the Word of God, the book. But some others would say, but there were some other writings that should be included. And some of you have heard about the, the apocrypha, apocryphal writings or the intertestamental books that are inserted in some books between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Fifteen or so additional books that are inserted between the two main sections of the Bible. It is a library. And there's controversy over what books should be in and what books should be out. But in general terms, the Old Testament contains the account of God's agreement based on the law with the people of Israel whom God chose as a model people through whom he would bless and speak to the rest of humanity. In this Old Testament, a lot revolves around the law that guides these chosen people of God in how they worship, in how they live, in how they relate to each other, in how they understand their relationship with God. The law is at the center of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Old Agreement between God and His people. In the New Testament, we find the account of the life of Jesus and the early church. And it sets out a new agreement, a new understanding, not based so much on law, but based on grace, God's unmerited favor to humanity, to all who will receive it, to all who will accept his means of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. Old Testament, New Testament. In that collection, God reveals his will for his creation. God reveals the fallen condition of humanity. God reveals our need for renewal in our relationship with him. God reveals the need for redemption and God's plan to bring this about through the work of Jesus Christ. In the Old and New Testament, we, can, we find a range of writings, types, styles of writings 
There is history and there is narrative and there's prophecy and there's poetry and there are letters. A range of different kinds of writings. All reflecting God's inspiration and God's story of relationship with humankind. The question is, so how did it all come together? How did we get the Bible? What is the process that brought it to us? Let's talk first about the Old Testament. Many of the Old Testament books indicate who the human author was. But not all of them do. It's not obvious for all of them. For others, it is in the text of the book that it becomes evident who the writer might be. Or it is just the history and tradition surrounding the people of Israel that guides us into knowing who the writer might be. So for example, many centuries of Jewish tradition hold that the, five, the first five books of the Bible, first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those first five books were written by Moses. That's the, the, the tradition that is held. But when you look closely at the books, it is, more, it is also possible that some of these books were not just written by one author. When you read, for example, Deuteronomy, that is supposed to have been written by Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 5 reads, And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. It's a little bit difficult for Moses to write a line like that. <laughs> you know? So it's quite likely that there were others who contributed in the spirit of Moses, if you will. Sometimes disciples of Moses or disciples of the main author of that particular book. But by whatever means were, that were available for those books to be written, over time, those inspired writings not only were written down and preserved but became a part of the body of teaching, the body of revelation, if you will, that the people of God accepted, that the nation of Israel accepted as their guiding. And the earliest biblical texts were probably eventually written on scrolls made from papyrus, a plant-based paper, or from parchment, Animal skins that had been scraped and burnished and stitched together. And it's very likely that all the books were initially written on scrolls. And that this became... So, so you, you, didn't, you didn't have a, a, a book yet with a compilation of those individual books. But you had the individual books, each a scroll of those individual books. And eventually, when the technology to make books became available, then those were included as books. And when the printing press became available, then those were, became, were able to be printed. But there are many more writings of the history and experiences of the people in the Old Testament. Not just those who are, which are now contained in these 39 books. There were other writings. But over time, the Jewish community came to accept these 39 books that comprises our Old Testament as the inspired and authoritative books to guide the community. Now, none of the, the original manuscripts are available. None of the original um, writings are available. What we have are copies 
of the original. Some may say, well, that might raise some questions. But what happens when, you know, one person copies and then doesn't quite copy what they are supposed to copy? And what happens over that period of time of copying and copying and copying and copying? Next week when we talk about why we can trust the scriptures, we'll talk a little bit about the intricate role of what were called scribes who were the ones responsible for doing the copying and how they, they followed very meticulous practices in maintaining the integrity of the copies that they did. But if that wasn't enough, some years ago, 1948, a whole discovery was made of old time old manuscripts. And when those manuscripts were compared with other manuscripts, it was interesting to see the, co the, the corroboration, how there, there were just slight details, differences of, of, of spelling or some, some little insignificant differences. The main content were essentially the same. Let me tell you about that, that, that story. In 1948, an Arab boy looking for a lost goat, as most children would, this young boy entertained himself by throwing rocks as he walked. And he's walking in this area, the valley of the Dead Sea, and he is walking a, past a set of caves. And he throws some rocks in one of these caves and he hears the sound of pottery breaking. Scampering up the hill and into the cave, the boy found some leather scrolls with ancient writings on them. Amazingly, he had stumbled across what is now known today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Inside the cave were hundreds of scrolls. It's happened in 1948. Among the important discoveries from the caves were copies of several books of the Old Testament. And these copies were produced from about 200 BC or somewhere between 200 BC and 100 AD, which made them almost 900 years older than the oldest available copies that had been around prior to that. And when these were compared with the other younger copies, there were only small insignificant differences. The point is that here were a set of scrolls that for all intents and purposes had no obvious connection with the scrolls that were available apart from the fact that they were supposed to contain the same material. But when compared with each other, they had pretty much the same information. What that said to us was that this process of copying and copying and copying was more authentic and true. And the integrity of the, of the contents of those manuscripts maintained much better than we think, than our skeptical minds might imagine. What about the New Testament? Of course, by the end of the first century, all the books that co comprise our New Testament were completed. All the Gospels, the letters of Paul, and so on, all of them were completed by the end of the first century. But there were other books. And of course, you know, the Vinci Code and so many other books now are raising questions about, so what about the Gospel of Thomas? What about the Gospel of Mary? What about these other books that do not feature in the New Testament Why you leave them out? You know? 
Why were that they not included? There are many gospels, there are many writings about events related to Jesus' life. But some were not included when it came to compiling the New Testament. And that process of compilation is, is what we refer to as canonization. And the word canon originated in reference to a standard by which something is measured. The process of canonization has to do with what writings are deemed to be inspired and included in the New Testament. Just like in the case of the Old Testament where these books were copied and circulated, so too these writings that happened around the time of Christ and the, the beginning of the early church were circulated to many of the churches scattered around the Roman Empire. And one of the interesting bits of information about Old Testament copies, new, sorry, New Testament copies that were made is that there are more manuscripts of New Testament bits and pieces available than any other literature of that period. And again, just as that kind of comparison between older and newer copies yielded very little difference, the same thing is true of older and newer copies of the New Testament scriptures. Of course, when the writers of the New Testament were writing these accounts of Jesus' life or writing when Paul was writing a letter to the Corinthian church or writing a letter to, the, to Ephesus or whatever. At that time, it, it was, they weren't writing as if this was going to be the scriptures. When they referred to the scriptures as Jews at that time, they were talking about the Old Testament scriptures. But in the same way that those writings in Old Testament times became regarded as inspired writings as a, and a means by which the, the community of God's people should be governed. So too, some of those writings about Jesus' life, about the start of the church, about instructions that Paul sent and others to the churches became a guide and became accepted over time as part of God's inspired and authoritative word. And the big question really is, so on what basis did they just stick with these 27 books and leave out all the others, the Thomas and the so on? And there are a number of criteria that govern what was selected, but I want to highlight just three. Several criteria, but let me highlight three. The first important criteria that made a, a piece of writing at that time considered as inspired was whether or not the document was written by one of the apostles, one of the original apostles who were with Jesus or written by someone who was associated in some way with an apostle. So the, what we refer to as the apostolicity of the writing was considered. Was it written by an, an apostle or by someone with close association with the apostle? The second important criteria was this. Was the content of this book in conformity with the apostles' teaching? What the apostles had come to understand as what Jesus was teaching them and which they taught to the, the, those believers who, who were becoming a part of the followers of Christ? Was it consistent with that teaching? with that understanding. That was another important criteria. 
And then the third important criteria was that, as I said, a lot of these letters and writings were circulated throughout the different churches in the Roman Empire. And one of the questions about these materials was how widespread and how accepted and used by the churches everywhere was this piece of writing. How widespread, how accepted, and how relevant and used by the churches everywhere was this particular piece of writing. So, for example, the Gospel of Thomas. There is a, a, a gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. Didn't make it, didn't make the cut. Because there were some questions about authorship. Was the author an apostle or connected with the apostle? But there's another book in the Bible that we don't even know the author of now. It's the book, the book of, of Hebrews. Even now we don't know who is the real author of the book of Hebrews. But the content of Hebrews was consistent with the apostles' teaching and was used consistently by the churches throughout the Roman Empire. And got to be considered as part of the canon of Scripture. You know, some say, well, I think that there were some people who had too much power and they were the ones who decided what the 27 were. So you hear names like Eusebius, who was one of the earliest church historians. And, would, and they would say it was what Eusebius said that, that they decided on. Or some would say, it's Constantine. Poor Constantine get a bad name for a lot of things. Eh? <laughs> it's Constantine. And because he was, you know, emperor of the Roman Empire, that he just, he became a Christian and he just said, this is what must go and that's, that's what, it, what it was. But when you look at the history of that process of canonization, that is to say, the process by which the church reflected on which one of these writings belong in the canon of Scripture, what you find is a range of church fathers or church leaders contributing to this decision. Or you see a number of gatherings of the church contributing to this decision. Eusebius recognized 22 of the 27 books as inspired. Cyril of Jerusalem in 350 AD recognized 26 of the books as inspired. The Laodicean Synod in 363 recognized 26 of the books. In a lot of these, there were questions about books like Revelation. Just wondering whether Revelation. But the collective wisdom was that this was as much a part of the canon of Scripture as the Gospels were. For it was as widely known and acknowledged and the, the apostolicity was without question. Athanasius in 367 recognized 27 of the books, those the 27 that we have. Gregory of Nazianus in 390 recognized those 27 books. The African canons in 393 to 410 recognized the 27 that have become those books. Jerome in 394, Augustine in 395, all recognize the 27 books as those inspired, which have now become our New Testament. The Carthage Synod at first recognized 26 and had questions about Revelation. And four years later, when the Synod met again, they were able to come to consensus on all 27. Friends, it is unfair to think 
that this process was eroded by individual personalities. For in this process by which the Bible has come to us, the hand of God has directed some of that process. Not only has he inspired the writers, but his hand has been on the direction of the process by which those books have become compiled. It is the word of God. 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament have been transmitted to us as that word, but not without controversy. My prayer, friends, is that you and I will not be afraid of the controversy. But you and I, as people of the book, will be willing to face the controversies and understand why, despite the controversies, this is reli a reliable source of God's revelation of God's self to humanity. And that if we are willing to trust this revelation and the person at the center of this revelation, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that we may become not just people who have the book, but people who know the book and people who live by the book. O oh, people, O oh, people of God, may you and I benefit from the word of God in all the ways possible. And my, the prayer of my heart is that you and I will have a hunger for that word that will pursue our understanding way past the controversies that you and I may stand on the authority of Scripture, that it may govern our lives, and that you and I may be the men and women, young man, young woman, that God wants you and I to be. That's my prayer for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son.